Good morning, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Sunday, the 23rd of November. Getting ready for the outsiders. 28 degrees under the trees and 40 degrees in the clearing. Will she or won't she? An anxious nation bates its breath. And the waiting is not quite over, not yet. Senator Jackie Lambie's departure from the ranks of the Palmer United Party seems to be a strategic withdrawal executed with all the careful deliberation of the retreat from Anzac Cove. This morning, News Corp national political editor Samantha Maiden is all but certain. Lambie may not be out, but she's in the process of going. Or to put that another way... Clive Palmer's berserk recruit, Jackie Lambie, has warned her political critics that even a machine gun won't stop her confirming she will sit as an independent. Not that she can confirm anything just yet, other than the certainty that nothing will stop her confirming. What a delicate game of Cat and Glenn Lazarus this is. The senator evinces a simple certainty. So, my actions speak for themselves. I am just going to stand on my feet and I am going to walk the gauntlet with my head held high and that's the way it's going to be done. When it's done, which we can't quite confirm. But having said that, we can confirm that she's confirming. Never mind the Lambie waltz. This morning, Sunday Age is asking the really big questions. When can her boyfriend sleep over? When can I leave her home alone? When can he walk to school alone? When does he get a mobile phone? Because sometimes the tricky issues of modern parenting are best delegated to the infinite and sober reason of someone at a newspaper. A paper that this morning cautions the right answer will differ from child to child depending on their personality, experience and your family values before going on to gaily generalise. There are parenting issues of a different stripe in the Sunday Age stable mate, the Sun Herald, this morning. Cautionary tales from what that paper dubs the Ice Age. These Sydney teenagers all tried the drug ice by the time they were 14. They were all addicts. One turned to prostitution, others begged, robbed and bashed to get it. All of which puts... When can he walk to school alone? In its place on the spectrum of parental concern, which reaches peak worry with this morning's Sunday Telegraph. A paper which this morning has decided... It's time to start talking and break this sad taboo. Which is to say, youth suicide. The paper details several recent tragic incidents and concludes... These cases have gone unreported because educators and mental health experts fear sensational publicity could encourage copycats. But the Sunday Telegraph believes the fact such young children are attempting suicide compels our society to talk about the problem. And having done so pretty much makes that vexed and difficult argument moot. If anything I've just said raises issues or concerns for you, call Lifeline 13 Double one, one four. Time now for Outsiders. I'm Barry Cassidy and you're not. True that. Uh, don't forget to vote if you haven't done already for our On The Contrary Grand Final because I'm here to tell you it's neck and neck. So, it's in your hands. Our Outsiders this morning... They're not voting because they're talking. They are Rowan Dean, editor of The Spectator Australia, Sophie Black, editor-in-chief at Private Media, and Eric Jensen, editor of The Saturday Paper. Good morning and welcome to you all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Jonathan. Oh, How are you? Very dulcet there, Rowan. It's <laughs> coming in godlike over the top. This has been an extraordinary week for, for, for many reasons, but I think this exchange early in the week was most certainly one of them. I, I, I can't work miracles, Alan. Uh, there is no magic wand, but this is a government here in Australia. But, uh, can Tony Abbott go and buy a farm in China? Well... Can, uh, no, yeah, the answer's no, Prime Minister. The answer is no, he can't. Nor can he buy a coal mine, nor can he buy a steel mill. You've got Ningo Dairy Group, is one of China's biggest milk companies. They've already spent $15 million buying three dairy farms in Gibson. The Prime Minister, I'm telling you out there, they are on fire in the pubs. They don't swallow this. And they've said, Ningo...
don't mean to, I don't mean to, to uh, in any way denigrate the very significant role that you play, and it's the most important role in Australia, but nonetheless, the people who vote are the masters, aren't they? They have given you whatever authority you've got. They don't agree with this. Uh, Alan Jones on, on Sydney Radio, talking with the Prime Minister, uh, Rowan Dean, is there trouble in paradise in, in conservative Australia? <laughs> Well, it is. It was a, a pretty interesting uh, exchange there, and it does go to the point that uh, people who think that uh, Tony Abbott is in somehow in the pocket of Alan Jones and 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 people of of the right uh, have got it wrong. They've misread Tony Abbott. Um, it, of any any um, free trade exchange, any free trade deal is going to have people who who get upset about what that means from from a kind of protectionist point of view. Mm. Um, and the issue that Alan Jones is talking about of the uh, Chinese in particular buying up large swathes of Australian property and businesses and all the rest is a perfectly legitimate uh, discussion to have and to look at. Um, the, the point that he kind of missed in all that is that the free trade agreements with, uh, with, with China, with South Korea, with Japan, and it looks like we're going to be having one with India, which is just so critical, uh, really opens up jobs for Australian people. If that comes at the cost of giving the Chinese and others access to, to things which have been protected more or less in the past, then that's the price you pay. But ultimately, Australians win because of, of those free trade agreements. And that's that's all good news for the government. I mean, I, the thing, Sophie Black, to take it a little bit away from the actual detail of the free trade agreements is, is how this fits into the course of a week where... Yes, we had the wash-up from the G20, we had free trade agreements, we had what on the face of it should have been an exceptional time for the government, but we see Alan Jones having a crack at him. We see Andrew Bolt writing a huge column this week saying that this government is doomed unless it follows my prescription for its future health. We see the Australian editorialising yesterday saying pretty much the same thing. What's going on? Well, things are looking grim when... Andrew Bolt is, is writing a 19-point action plan for the government entitled Change or Die. I'm impressed you counted that. <laughs> Change or Die. Uh, so, and it goes well beyond the free trade agreement. The well, polls... the Australian says yesterday the Abbott government is doomed without narrative. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a thread here. And there's a chorus, a mounting chorus, uh, that goes well beyond the free trade agreement. And maybe, maybe it does come down to Alan Jones's pub test. Uh, the thing is that, that the foreign policy wins are not enough for this, for, for this government. The public don't care enough about that, and domestically they are on the nose. And domestically, Eric, they're, they're trouble. They have a lot of unresolved business. Mm. And this is, uh, I think this is actually not so much about that unresolved business. This is about the, the role that columnists like Bolt see for themselves. Bolt believes but it's his job to carve out cultural space for government so that a government can do things it might otherwise not have been able to do. And this kind of column, he, he wrote a column very similar just after the government shelved their amendments to the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, the column is very much about saying, uh, remember me and remember the support I've given you in the past and let me try and find a little bit of space for you to occupy. And as, as part of wanting you to occupy that space, I want you to reshuffle your cabinet because that's what I think should happen now. And, and um, although the Australian's editorial yesterday didn't call for a reshuffle, I think it was doing many of the same things. It was saying, um, let's, let's not focus on the budget, which is obviously your largest issue. Let's focus on the cultural space. You need to do the things we want you to do. Do you think there's a sense, uh, Rowan, internally within the government of, of, of being somewhat on the edge of, of things that should be giving them great credit and great kudos not resonating? Yeah, Jonathan, I think that's very much the case, and I think it's more about that than about any kind of cultural space. The, there is a real frustration uh, amongst people on the right that uh, the government has achieved a, a small discord of successes, of wins. Uh, if you compare the competence of achievements in the last 12 months to the incompetence of previous six years, where nothing appeared to get done... Just ignoring uh, for a moment the, pre the last budget, which remains well, that's somewhat the, untidy. That's the or, frustration or the is the budget... The if I can just finish, sorry, Eric, if I can just finish, the frustration is that the measures that have all got through have all been good measures, the boats have been stopped, the mm -hmm. carbon tax is gone, all the promises were met. The big frustration is the budget, uh, which the government was voted in to fix and is really struggling to get measures through the Senate and past Labor. Uh, now, they're perfectly entitled to object to things if they want to, but many of those measures Labor themselves propose when they're in government. So the frustration is all the ticks are there, 
uh, but why isn't it being reflected in the opinion polls, particularly in the news poll, uh, which came as a shock to a lot of people. So I guess the feeling is, um, is it is it the structure of the government? Is it uh, Tony Abbott has proved himself a very efficient leader? He's got some star performers, Julie Bishop, Scott Morrison, spring to mind. Uh, so that I guess there's a sense but, but not, a, not best, effective. He's the best team playing at the, at the front. Not, not, not effective, front. though, in, in, in putting uh, those propositions publicly. I mean, is that the case, Eric? Is, is, is the failure here simply in the, uh, uh, the selling of the narrative, the advertising of the, of the government's work? I think the failure is larger than that. If that was simply the failure, then you would see uh, you'd see legislative change that wasn't popular. You're actually seeing no change. You're seeing a government incapable of getting legislation through either House of Parliament sometimes. Uh, Which, to be fair, is a, is a complex and difficult situation at the moment. But a, a government's inability to negotiate and compromise with a, with a crossbencher, with a, you know, with a parliament that reflects the people who elected it, uh, it is a failure. I mean, surely, surely being incapable of passing legislation means you're almost incapable of governing. Is and I think that, I mean, the failure on financial reforms this week and the way that's blown up in the government's face is a real example of that. They've underestimated some of these cost benches. They haven't done the groundwork with them, and and we're seeing the effects of that now. I mean, the financial thing, uh, Rowan, is, is, is kind of a nice emblematic issue. I mean, here was the government that kind of doing the bidding of uh, key sponsors, if you like. I mean, this was a thing which was maybe against consumer interest, but in the interest of the big banks. Uh, and, and not a thing rigorously uh, examined with the cross benches, you know, there was a, yeah, a certain I, I thing to take on the ground. It's issues like that and 18C and others which are kind of issues that are important to the libertarian, uh, free speech, free marketeering mindset that you would expect a Liberal Party uh, coalition to be getting through quite easily. And the fact that they've tripped up on those things, particularly at and was a, were, were, a, upset a lot of people, particularly libertarians, as I say, who are going, hang on, this is a very important issue for us. It's all about freedom of expression, freedom of thought. We don't want a Liberal government that is, it is turning its back on those things. And I think the FOFA was, a, was similar in that it, it's it's not an issue of big banks, it's an issue of your right as an individual to take risks and end up uh, suffering from those risks if, if that's what well, happens. Well, also the, the, the government's the, the overly individual right to seek financial advice with, yeah. with the comfort that it's not being exactly the idea conflict. that the law steps in and says, sorry, you must do this because it's good for you or not good for you, goes against libertarian values. So I think it's more to do with that. These are symbolic issues that the government has kind of turned its back on uh, you know, I think Tony Abbott said something about scraping off the barnacles or whatever, and not not worrying about these issues and concentrating on the on the on the main big issues, which is something John Howard did very successfully. So I guess that's the way forward. But it does has disappointed many people on the right that these issues are just being pushed one side. Well, one one issue that should please people on the right is is the, the stuff that's about to happen in this organisation tomorrow. Well, look, you know, I I mean, I've I've defended the prime minister on this uh, today and and earlier in the week. I think you've got to take his comments, which still, I mean, you know, he's, what he said, he said, you know, it's there, it's on the record. But you've got to take that in the context. And I, I can only assume that what Mr. Abbott was referring to, or was thinking about anyway, uh, was the proposition that there would be cuts in with the intent of reducing ABC services. Yeah. And we'd ruled that out. That's clear, I think. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull there explaining how the cuts to the ABC were not cuts to the ABC at all, uh, which we shouldn't, uh, Eric, uh, focus on as, as an issue in particular, but that, that, that thing of uh, consistent narrative, of, of, of truth-telling, of, of yeah, I mean, dependable. Tony Abbott's uh, long-running and difficult relationship with the truth that goes back, you know, as well, it probably goes back to his time writing uh, leaders for the Australian. But but after that, you know, it, it goes perhaps to to things like saying to Kerry O'Brien in that in that interview, uh, unless I write it down, it can't be taken seriously. Um, he didn't write this down, and, and uh, you know, uh, in the various attempts to defend what he said on the night before the election, when he said there'd be no cuts to the SBS or the ABC or changes to the GST or changes to pensions or cuts to education or cuts to health, all of which uh, more or less has happened in the year since. Um, 
you know, maybe, maybe that wasn't to be taken at face value. And, and the difficulty that his team have had trying to explain that, I think, says something about the difficulty this government has trying to be coherent. That's that point, Rowan, of explanation, isn't it, that's critical there. It's all very well to say, yes, well, this is what we said before the election, but circumstances are such that you yeah, can make exactly, that case. Jonathan, I, I, I thought Malcolm... Okay, well, here endeth part one of The Outsiders on the upload limit.